Obviously the last video was a little major. We covered the biggest arcade games that Sega had to offer, the Super Scaler titles. This video here meanwhile is nowhere near as significant. We're covering one solitary board that's largely based off a home console, and most of this board's games only ever came out in Japan. Still, it's a chance to have a look at some pretty obscure titles, a lot of which are actually quite cool. Sega have made a hell of a lot of arcade games over the years and there's plenty of good ones out there aside from those that everybody knows. And so here we are, the Sega Titan video, otherwise known as the STV. What exactly is the STV then? In very simple terms it's basically an arcade Saturn. The board's hardware is virtually identical with the same processors, special chips and all of that. The major difference is in physical media. All STV games bar one use warm cartridges instead of compact discs. Needless to say, they're not exactly the prettiest of games to look at, but what exactly would you expect? So the games by and large take advantage of the Saturn's best features, particularly the 2D ones, which are absolutely fantastic. The Saturn is the undisputed champion of 2D in the 32-bit era, and the STV is no different. The 3D meanwhile is a little different when compared to what you see on the PlayStation and still totally okay for the era. Although most of the games you will see here are two dimensional. I mean obviously in most cases Sega would use a model board for a major 3D game rather than something based on the Saturn. The lifespan of the STV was a little bit longer than the console itself. The last game on the hardware came out in 2000. Before we get into the usual list, it's probably a good idea to examine the best ways to actually play STV games. Naturally some folks may go for the real hardware approach. An STV motherboard corresponds nicely to the jammer standard, so it'll play nicely with your supergun. It seems like you can expect to pay about £100 to £150 for the board, a little bit more than the regular Saturn. You can probably expect to pay between 15 and 30 quid for most of the common STV carts, and you may well end up paying a fair bit less for certain games on STV than you would on Saturn. Expensive shooter poster child Radiant Silver Gun, for example, is still rather pricey on STV, but not the upwards of £500 you can expect to pay for a Saturn copy. Multicart options exist for the STV board as well, if you don't fancy collecting loads of generic grey cartridges. As for emulation, well, it's variable. Most STV games are easily playable through emulation, although not all. There are a couple of games that simply aren't available at all yet, which is unfortunate. Pretty much all of the 2D STV games work totally fine in MAME, while the 3D games can be inconsistent. 3D just isn't something that MAME does very well a lot of the time, meaning that games like Die Hard Arcade can be a little slow. This isn't often a major issue, of course. In most cases you can just play the Saturn version of the game either through emulation or on the wheel fin, seeing as it's literally the exact same. Saturn emulation is kind of iffy generally, of course, although it is slowly getting better. However, sadly most of the big emulators are yet to include STV emulation in their package. There is a new one out there, Kronos, that does include STV games. However, it's still very much a work in progress. But with a combination of both arcade and Saturn emulation, you can play just about everything the STV has to offer. And with that, well, let's go to the games themselves. First off, there's a lot of unranked games to look at. Quite a lot of them aren't necessarily games. The very popular Print Club series by Atlas, for example, got its sequel on the STV hardware, and there's an absolute ton of those available along with some spin-offs like Aroma Club, Movie Club, Name Club, and even something very weird called Pokemon Photo. Having something Pokemon related appear on Sega hardware seems quite intriguing, although I imagine the machine itself isn't actually interesting at all. There is of course various games that you'll have difficulty playing at all unless you know your Japanese, such as quiz games as well as the usual range of Marjon tiles, there's even a Hanafudera game out there. You'll also find a bunch of toddlers machines and medal games, including one that's based on Fantasy Zone. A few of these are playable in MAME and consist of one very simple thing that you have to do, followed by a roulette for a ticket. Very simple indeed, not exactly worth listing individually. 
So with loads accounted for, there are the few proper titles that sadly could not be listed. Let's quickly go through them. We've got Koro Q Hyper Racing 5, a kart racing game based on a line of car toys produced by Takara. There's lots of video games based on these toys and a few have been localised in the West, with Penny Racers and Road Trip Adventure for the PS1 and PS2 respectively probably being the best known of them. The machine for this is 4 players and looks quite cool, but there's no way to play it on main because it doesn't run well enough. We've got two sports fishing games. These machines are very nice looking indeed, the aim of the game is simply to catch as many fishes as possible, and the second of these games is the only STV title to actually not come out on a ROM cartridge. Sadly, not playable yet. The other two notable ones are Super Major League and Tecmo World Cup 98, a baseball and football game respectively, and yeah, they just don't run well enough in main to be playable right now. It's perhaps surprising that neither of these got ported to the Saturn themselves, but it never happened for whatever reason. And with that we're able to get on with counting down the rest of the games from best to worst. We've got a bit less than most other board lists, only 35 this time out, ranging from excellent shoot 'em ups and big names to some… Uh, quite strange titles indeed. <laughs> Let's go. The first games on this list really aren't going to be too much to speak of, but we must look at them for completion's sake. Here's Zenkoku Saifuku Bishoujo Grand Prix Find Love. Why is it bottom? Well, a couple of reasons. The first is that the gameplay here is pretty minimal, a collection of simple things like jigsaws and sliding puzzles that do not exactly tax the mind in any way. Secondly, well, it's all wrapped up in some impossibly cringy anime dating sim gubbins that goes far beyond acceptable levels of total daftness. Like, just why would you play this? Ever? I mean, life's far too short. So yeah, not recommended. Sega would make a little name for themselves in the quite niche world of fishing games around the turn of the millennium. I mean, we all love a bit of Sega bass fishing, don't we? I mean, how the bloody hell can you not? But a lot of times when you're fishing you end up catching naffle and musing on the amount of time you've clearly just bloody wasted. And that's what sea bass fishing here is all about. This is beyond dull, you never seem to get a sodding bite, and the graphics are ugly as sin. It's certainly not going to lure you in, <laughs> is it? <laughs> I wouldn't tackle this. <laughs> it doesn't deserve your uh, attention. <laughs> it's quickly going to cast itself out of your memory. <laughs> okay, I'll stop now. Let's Play A Fellow is more than just the title of a YouTube video that's probably been sitting on the platform since 2007 with about 4 views. It's also an arcade game. One of a couple here that's most likely going to be played by an adult, while the kids play other, more exciting titles. This is A Fellow, and not a whole lot more. If you enjoy A Fellow, and particularly if you're the late, great Michael Handel, champion player and star of BBC reality TV show The Armstrongs, you may well put this game considerably higher. If you're at best ambivalent towards a fellow like me, then well, here we are. There are certain games that you really wonder about after discovering them, especially when they're so clearly rubbish at a base level that makes you think, how did this concept even get approved? Such is the case with Funky Head Boxers. I mean, just look at this bloody thing! Now, I recognise that the actual arcade version of this probably isn't quite as glitchy as what you see here, that's a main thing, but I'd kinda hoped that Funky Heads would be more than digitised people's faces done in a way that makes me pine for the ultra realism of WWF Warzone on PS1. And of course the boxing itself is just very typical arcade boxing. You do little but bash buttons and hope for the best. Definitely not one for the history books. I 
Okay, this next one is a tricky one, but we are going with it. Pebble Beach Golf Links is just about playable. The gameplay is pretty much there, but the graphics are pretty darn glitchy with disappearing sprites and so forth. Perhaps this isn't the fairest of rankings as a whole. This is an arcade golf game by T&D Soft, a studio that was quite prolific indeed when it came to matters of golf, and it's perfectly fine. But alas, like every other golf game, it's just not Neo Turf Masters, is it? Just can't match up to that. And unfortunately, unlike the Saturn game with the same name, there's no come hither silky voiced Craig Stadler to be found in this arcade title. With that in mind, I just can't put it in the top 30. And here we have, for the new 32-bit generation, a brand new version of Columns. <laughs> Big whoop. The original Columns is certainly brilliant, of course, even if it's not necessarily a game you'd gravitate to in the arcades. But this here is just your basic Columns with a fancier skin. The fancier skin actually doesn't do the game an awful lot of favours in my opinion. I find that the graphics are a bit too busy and it's trickier to just, you know, see the shapes and recognise where they need to go. It doesn't flow as well. Columns as a game benefits in no way from this update at all. Absolutely no one was asking for a totally unchanged version of the game with such graphics. Stick with the original. And now we have a kooky little bit of advertising. An arcade game based around the joys of Mao Chan brand Instant Ramen. This title is a collection of minigames based around cooking up your sumptuous cup noodles, firing up the pot and all that other good stuff. It's a lot of joystick waggling and button bashing, really. So much so that I kinda hit a brick wall with getting the pot appropriately fired up. It's more demanding than Daily Thompson's Decathlon and I can never get the pot hot enough in time. Ugh, these noodles will just have to remain uncooked. It's certainly slight as a game but amusing as a concept. Columns is back almost immediately. Here we have Hanagumi Tyson Columns Sakura Wars, a competitive Columns title that comes complete with a license. And we have a similar story to Columns 97. It doesn't look quite as bad, but it's still a bit too busy. Just what was wrong with the original shapes? Nothing. So I bloody changed them. This isn't too much cop either. Stack Columns, released earlier for the old system seaboard, is a much better attempt at a competitive columns game, whereas this one can be passed over very easily. The Puzzle and Action series is back again! This is unfortunately by far the least of these games that I've played, although there is a much better one coming later. The concept is still here, of course. Kooky little games play very quickly, this time with a more competitive aspect, but uh, I don't know, I don't think that these games translate particularly well to 3D. It feels a bit more restrictive and the games don't feel quite as imaginative as they were previously. The original 16-bit games are far better, as indeed is the other 2D one that we're going to be looking at much further down the road. Steep Slope Sliders. Not a terrible game, just one that's probably only going to hold up for people who have been very intimate with it for years. This is a snowboarding game that was developed by, of all people, Cave. Yes, the same folks who are much more famous for their world class shoot 'em ups. It's a 3D game that's naturally quite a bit similar to the much more famous Cool Borders games on the PlayStation, although there are a fair few differences in how this game actually controls. Time has perhaps made both of these games a bit more equal, in all honesty. I never had much nostalgia for those PlayStation games either. Yeah, it's okay.
Next, we have the first of several fighting games on the list, some of which are quite amusingly strange. Ilan Dori, Legend of Dragoon by the rather obscure developer Sai Mate, fits into this category, although it's not necessarily that fun. The gimmick here is that everyone rides around on a dragon and the moves correspond to that. While you've got your physical attacks and so on, a lot of the focus is on big projectile moves that are pretty easy to pull off. It actually reminds me quite a bit of the old PS1 game Evil Zone, in that just a couple of button presses are all it takes to do big old particle effecty spectacular moves. Both that game and this are amusing to look at, but in the end you wish the play wasn't so shallow. Another entry, and another competitive puzzle game! Mosaki no Ojama The World isn't too bad, although it can be tricky to get your head around. Diagonal patterns with your blocks are the order of the day here, especially if you can get interlocking diagonal patterns. That's tough, but certainly satisfying. You can at least just put the same colour blocks together in a pinch if needs be. It's not bad, but this is one of those competitive games where getting the big patterns always just ends up feeling like they happened at random, more than actually working towards it. We do have better ones coming. Here at number 23 we have a game that generally comes in for a right kicking, and even if a lot of that isn't its own fault, it's not totally blameless. Golden Axe The Duel. It gets a kick in just because it exists. It didn't seem like anyone wanted Golden Axe to become a one on one fighting game like everything else, but <laughs> here we are. It also gets a kick in because it got a home port to the Sega Saturn, while all time legendary beat em up Revenge of Death Adder did not. And to many, this is quite clearly a grave miscarriage of justice. The game was doomed to be scorned as a result, no matter how good it was. Mind you, it's not like it's an amazing game. The duel isn't horrible, it's a perfectly okay weapons based fighting game with some very nice 2D sprite work, and at least the addition of some little gimmicks like collecting potions and what have you that tie the game into Golden Axe style mechanics. It's just fine. The problem is not only that there were many other fighting games around, but there were plenty other weapons based games too, and in order for the duel not to be spat at in the streets, it had to reach the gold standard SNK set with games like Samurai Showdown and Last Blade and it doesn't quite make it. While it doesn't deserve all the hate it gets, I couldn't say that the duel is anything particularly special. The next adults play this while kids play something more fun game in the list is Shanghai The Great Wall. And it's Shanghai with a timer. You just plunk some coins in so that you can spend more intimate time with the tile matching puzzle. Really there's no way this game should be up as high as number 22, it, it scarcely deserves it, but uh, what can I say, I have a soft spot for Shanghai, and I get a kick out of playing Shanghai type games even when they're as generic as this one. It still didn't stop me clicking the insert coin button a few times more than usual just to see if I could match up any more titles. Bloody Finn. So, do you like yourself a bit of Konami's Suikoden? Do you kinda wish that all those characters had found themselves a fighting game at some point? What do you mean, no? Well in any case, while there was never officially a Suikoden fighting game, Data East's Outlaws of the Lost Dynasty comes close. It's loosely based on the same Chinese water margin stories with some added mythos after all. This game is basically in the same boat as Golden Axe The Duel in that it's a weapon based fighting game that does unfortunately fall short of the mark compared to the best in the field, although Outlaws of the Lost Dynasty comes with far less baggage and as such is probably a bit easier for people to enjoy. And it is indeed a perfectly ok 2D fighting game. Nothing special and we certainly have better 2D fighters to come, but likeable enough.
You couldn't have 3D arcades becoming commonplace without having a game where you just bash buttons relentlessly to oblivion, could you? And while International Track and Field on the PlayStation is probably the best known game of this type from the generation, Sega's Decathlete came out some time before and, if I'm honest, it actually looks a fair bit better. It certainly has a nice line when it comes to funny comedy athletes such as everyone's favourite, the almighty Rick Blade, or the plucky Brit Robin Banks. As far as the game goes, it's the very typical play you're used to, bashing buttons on the track, getting the angles right in the field, and trying to qualify or, if you're really good, set a world record. Simple, but certainly fun. Some folks, knowing my tastes, might have expected All Japan Pro Wrestling featuring Virtua to come higher. I mean, it's a 3D wrestling game from an utterly almighty promotion that gives you the opportunity to play as Misawa, Kawada, Kobashi, Hansen. A good chunk of Kinsroad's favourites are here. Not only that, but you can even play as Wolf and Virtua Fighter, a cross-promotion that actually resulted in an American wrestler, Jim Steele, cosplaying as Wolf Hawkfield in the actual All Japan promotion for several years. Still, this was the first game in a series, and while this first attempt by Sega is good and actually does a neat job of condensing a wrestling match into a couple of minutes of arcade fun, things would only get bigger and better once this became Giant Gram in the Dreamcast Naomi generation. Still, it's always nice to see a decent spot of wrestling in the list. I guess this is a similar story while also being kind of a weird entry to see here. The original Virtua Fighter, Arcade Monolith, is obviously more famous as a Model 1 game. Virtua Fighter Remix here is the second Saturn version of said game with improved textures, and it got an STV version too. I should note that emulators really don't seem to like this game too much, hence why it looks a bit glitchy. Virtua Fighter is, of course, an arcade classic, but again, later instalments would better it. Virtua Fighter 2 is so much more playable and, in fact, we've got a version of that coming up a little later in the list too, so VF Remix only comes in at number 18. I think we'll obviously have a fair bit more to say about Virtua Fighter and its impact when we do the big Sega model video. It stands to reason that if you've got an athletics game based around the Summer Olympics, you should have one based on Winter Olympics too. Unfortunately, in most cases, the Winter Olympics game is far worse than the Summer one. Developers seem to struggle to really emulate the Winter events a lot of the time. However, Sega's Winter Heat is a very welcome exception. It keeps things pretty simple, and it manages to nail it. I'm taking this one over Decathlete because it's still got the typical events with button bashing and angles and the like, but the addition of things like skiing or the luge and all of that does make for a lot more variation in the gameplay, which is welcome indeed and the standard of presentation is just as neat here as it was in the first game. Very nice. Here's an odd one. You don't see too many isometric games like this in the arcade, but here we are. Princess Kuara Daisakusen is a game by Atlas that spins off from the Power Instinct series of fighting games where the princess is a fighter. You can play as her, or her sister, or a big frickin' half-human, half-bear creature. Not much choice really, is there? The game itself is cool. You get a ranged attack, but I find it a bit easier to get in close, if I'm honest. Naturally, you've got special attacks too if you're really in the doo-doo. The look of the game, with the tiles in the sky and what have you, Almost makes me think of this as a distant relative of Bastions, but then there's lots of strategy RPGs and the like which look like this game too. It is quite cool and not exactly well known, so you might want to give this a bit of a stab.
Right, here's a name you might not have expected to see. Batman Forever. <laughs> Seriously? Leaving aside the film, game-wise, naturally you're going to think of the abysmal console game with dreadful Mortal Kombat-esque controls. However, the arcade and Saturn game, despite also being by acclaim, is totally different. Instead, it's a fast-moving proper brawler where the simplest click of a button can make Batman beat the piss out of goons in a thousand different ways. You know, kind of like what Batman does. This game's kind of all about the flashy effects. It just chucks power-ups at you relentlessly, and they usually result in some bout of screen-filling unpleasantness for every enemy in sight. It's actually kind of cool. While it has to be said that the gameplay in this game is shallow, even for a beat-em-up, it's not terrible at all. Certainly a far cry from that bloody home game. Having previously said in a video that I struggle a lot with Puyo Puyo, I find myself warming more and more to the series as we go along and check out more sequels and variations. Puyo Puyo's son right here is the best one yet. The general gameplay is still very much in the Puyo Puyo vein, but the Sun Jewel is the biggest addition here. Get that into your line and you'll take out every jewel of the same colour, making for some very nice combos indeed. Puyo Puyo and its many variations do just work so nicely when it comes to the competitive puzzler, usually because there's quite a cool progression from building up at the start, going through the middle, and then having an utterly frantic endgame where usually both players are right near the top. I have to say that I guess I get it now. Okay, this one here might surprise folks. Final Fight Revenge? <laughs> really? Usually this game tends to come in for a right kicking. As far as a brawler being turned into a fighting game goes, this tends to get it in the neck even more than Golden Axe the Duel does. And yet, despite some quite glaring flaws, I actually do like Final Fight Revenge a lot, and I have a lot of fun playing it. I suppose the most obvious flaw, and one that people can't usually get past, is the sheer ugliness. It's a 3D game and the models are, <laughs> they're not pretty. Not only that, this game came out as late as 1999. It's one of the last STV games, and it is in fact pretty much the last non-compilation title to be released at all on the Sega Saturn. It especially doesn't look good if you compare it to contemporaries, seeing as that would include frickin' Tekken 3, Soul Calibur, and Capcom's own rival Scorts. But although the models are a bit revolting, there is at least a certain cartooniness and charisma about them. Final Fight Revenge doesn't exactly take itself seriously, and I think they were going for a bit of a weird 3D caricature dealio. The actual gameplay itself is also just very entertaining. It's a nice and speedy 3D fighter, mixing your typical solid Capcom play with grabbing weapons and power-ups, and some really fun super moves such as dragging people along the ground or running them down with a cop car that you actually control. Gotta be honest, I have a really soft spot for this one. It's easy to dismiss it, and I certainly have done in the past, but I don't think it deserves nearly as much hate as it always gets. Hmm, maybe this is equally surprising. This here's Radiant Silvergun, a highly acclaimed darling of a shoot 'em up by no lesser studio than Treasure. But it's only number 12. Well, I suppose I ought to confess, as much as I like most Treasure games, I don't necessarily enjoy all of them, and I've never managed to get with their shoot 'em ups. They're almost too hardcore. You've got a lot of nice features, of course. There's tons of weapons to choose from here, it's particularly fun to use the sword, and the package is certainly flashy. But, my god, this game will break you. The biggest challenge is not just having to deal with loads of bullets, but the endless, very narrow passages. It's almost like R-Type, only vertical, and taking on those while dealing with bullets? <laughs> yeah, not easy. I do get why people really love this and Ikaruga and all of that, they're just not for me.
And here, just outside the top 10, we've got another competitive puzzle game. I wonder if constantly seeing such things might irritate those who don't care much for these games, but hey ho, there always seems to be a lot of them. This is the best STV one though, I really like Baku Baku Animal. The gimmick here that makes it a bit different is you've got animals and food, and you have to match the two of them. Pandas eat bamboo, monkeys eat bananas, rabbits eat carrots, and so on. You've got to think pretty fast and be aware of what's going on at all times, but the game does allow for big combos, and again, like all good puzzle games, it does get really frantic at the end. As such, even if this game is not a looker, it does make for a very fun arcade experience, much like Puyo Puyo Sun does. Quite frankly, I thought this was bloody excellent, and it's the sort of game I love finding out about through doing lists like this one. It's another gem to add to the set on MAME. Ok, top 10 time. And we start with another cool gem that I didn't know about at all. Astra Superstars, a 2D fighting game and a jolly good one. This game by Sunsoft is a bit different to a lot of other fighters in that it takes place entirely in the air. There's only a few other fighting games I can think of that do the same thing. Actually, a Landui earlier on in this list was one of them. This game is actually kind of similar to that in play, but it's a lot more involved and a lot better executed. It has a nice flow to it that helps you to build some very nice combos. It all looks very anime and all that of course, which you would probably expect, and you get some odd little sprite manipulation and what have you, but yeah, this is a very nice fighter. Definitely worth playing. <laughs> It's funny, I did mention that the STV was home to excellent shoot 'em ups at the start of the video, but we've barely seen any of them so far. Why? Well, because half of this top 10 is packed with the cream of the crop top level shoot 'em ups, some of the best you'll ever find, in fact. First up is a game all Western YouTubers are guaranteed to screw up the pronunciation of it's Soku Guentai. This is a fearsome bout of bullet hell courtesy of the folks at Ryzen. It'll test you pretty much right from the off. Naturally you've got plenty of weapons to take on the baddies with, including one of the cooler ones out there, the laser web. You hold the button down and gradually fill the space with your web, and when you release it, you call a rocket strike taking down any enemy that's inside your web. It takes a few seconds to fully charge, but it's great to time a web so that you start every new little wave of enemies with a really big attack. Fantastic little game, much loved by shooter fanatics, and for very good reason indeed. Just as Virtua Fighter Remix ended up on the STV board, it also got the rather kooky and super deformed spin off of Virtua Fighter 2, Virtua Fighter Kids. It's still the same Virtua Fighter 2 action that everybody knows, but now everyone is, well, smaller and stranger looking. Once again it's obviously going to be more appropriate to talk about the general brilliance of Virtua Fighter 2 when we get to the Sega model list, for that is truly the game's home, but even if the look of this game may not perhaps be to everybody's taste, it pretty much keeps the exceptional fighting play intact. Guess who's back? Yep, it's Cotton. We haven't seen successors somewhat kooky, somewhat anime and witchily excellent shooter series since the first System 16 video. The odd thing about Cotton, mind, is that you think there's more games in the series than there actually was. There is surprisingly only two proper horizontal shoot 'em ups in the series that got a couple of spin-offs, one of which will even be appearing shortly. Cotton 2 then is the sequel to Fantastic Night Dreams, and now the game's got something of a 2D, 3D look about it, which does work pretty well. There's some very nice creations indeed here. As per usual with Cotton, you get some fairly strong RPG elements such as levelling up and the like, you get a whole load of weirdness, and the ability to grab and chuck enemies all over the place, sort of like an even better zero win. And of course, there will be tea. Lots and lots of tea, thus making this Nostalgia Nerd's favourite game. I'm sure. 
I really love the music in this too. It's kind of understated and has a little bit of an Amiga mod vibe about it, which is very nice. This is absolutely awesome. Although again, there's an even better spin-off on the way. And here's my pick for STV's Top Fighter. It's another one that's perhaps not too well known. Groove on Fight by Atlas is the third entry in their Power Instinct series of fighting games. Honestly, the only thing I really knew about this series beforehand was the awful Mega Drive fighting game, the one that's sometimes known as Deadly Moves. Thankfully things have moved on just a little bit since then. Groove on Fight is an excellent 2D fighting game. The big gimmick here is one that's more famously used in Capcom's Marvel games. You've got a team of two fighters that can be tagged in and out, and both have to be beaten down. There's plenty of fancy special moves in the familiar combinations you'd expect, and some really lovely sprite work indeed. It's a gorgeous game, one of the best looking 2D fighters I've seen. It may not necessarily be the most original package, Power Instinct's roots as a pretty shameless Street Fighter ripoff are still certainly visible, but it had definitely come a long way. Kind of a shame then that this would be the last game in the series for a good few years. <laughs> Top 5 time, and after Cotton 2, we've now got Cotton Boomerang. Seeing as this game does use almost the same levels and enemies and all that as Cotton 2, I did wonder if they should be combined into one entry. However, Cotton Boomerang makes enough changes to the play that it can be treated as its own entity. The biggest change is that in Boomerang you don't just have one witch to play as, you pick a team of three. These three act as your lives, of course, but they all have wildly different shots and powers, they can be levelled up as normal, and you can switch between them. You can only do this a limited amount of times in the level, but doing it also acts as a screen clearing bomb. The game has also been rearranged a fair bit to make it even harder, and there's more cool music. There's some neat experimentation like using the fairy characters. They pack a massive punch, more so than our regular witches, but they're so small that you may lose track of them on a busy playing field. And of course, plenty more tea. Overall, this is probably my pick for the best cotton game. A very different and wonderful shooter indeed. We had a not all that good puzzle and action earlier on in the list, but here's Sando R to wipe all of that away and lend some. I've talked plenty already about these games, the spawn of Bonanza Brothers, how they make generally easy tasks quite tricky just by giving you very little time to do them in, all of that. It's a simple formula that works, and Sando R doesn't change things up too much. Instead it simply produces the most fun and kooky set of action puzzles we've seen so far, making for an excellent sequel. Discovering these games and actually playing them properly has definitely been one of the major highlights of making these Sega arcade vids, it has to be said. Absolutely brilliant stuff. The top threes here, and the shoot 'em ups continue to come. This one here is Shienryu a game by Warashi. These guys aren't particularly well known, although Trigger Heart Exelica is probably their most famous title. This one here is your classic 2D vertical shooter, and I really do mean classic. Shenru has kind of an old school vibe about it, singling it out from the bullet hell games that were very popular around this time. In fact, I'd consider this game to basically be a love letter to classic Toa Plan vertical shooter maps, your Truxtons and Fire Sharks. The weapons are kind of a dead giveaway, really. The classic spray, the awesome homing laser of death. There's a lot of homage to the old masters, and it's very welcome. In fact, I'd go as far to say that Toa Plan would have definitely made this game, had they lasted into the 32-bit generation. This may be a more obscure entry in the arcade shooter line on the Saturn, but it's an absolute belter, and highly recommended indeed.
If there's one little subgenre that's really come good through making this list, it's the vertical tank shooter. We've already had one game that I didn't know too well, Heavy Metal, come out of nowhere to be the runner up in an earlier list, and now we've got another. In fact, Guardian Force may just be the best vertical tank shooter that I've ever played. It's not necessarily a game you'd perhaps expect to see as late as 1998. You might think that this sort of shooter run and gun hybrid might have been done by now, but clearly success didn't think so. This is the absolute best of the genre, just quality all the way through, and I found it so hard to put down. Even if this wasn't fashionable at the time, it clearly deserved so much more. I mean, it's even higher here than Successor's signature cotton titles, and it shows that there was plenty more to them than rather cutesy and tea-obsessed witches. This was so good that it actually did get quite close to the number one spot. However, in the end, the title goes to the game you would have probably expected it to go to. While most of these games are pretty obscure, Dynamite D Curb, or Die Hard Arcade if you're in the West, most certainly is not, being that it's an arcade hit which Sega have seen fit to port a good couple of times over the years. It's the signature STV title for a lot of people, a game that I played far more than any other game on this list back in the day, and eventually it gets the top slot. Dynamite Deco is a really nice mix of old and new. Even if everything's all polygons and glorious 3D now, it's still a very traditionally satisfying brawler. You've got a whole range of enemies to punch and kick square in the face, or indeed in the balls. There's also weapons, lots and lots of them, ranging from big bazookas and pistols to ballistic, um, brooms. They all do damage and they're all really fun to use. There's the quick time events which are a good little addition, all the nice slow motion replays and that when you get one of them spot on. The western license is also fun even if the game doesn't actually bear an awful amount of resemblance to Die Hard beyond a hero that does look a little bit like Brucey and a big office building where all the action takes place in. It's not long before the license goes off the rails, but this is a womp of a game that doesn't necessarily take itself seriously. Hell, it even allows you to play the ancient arcade game Deep Scan. <laughs> Just because. Not only do I have fond memories of this game, it's more than held up well, and I'll always fire it up every now and again. It was a pretty clear choice for the top spot. And that's another Sega Arcade board list done. The STV is quite an interesting subject. Perhaps the general quality of the games here has not been quite as high as it has in other lists, but there's still a fair few excellent titles here that you absolutely should play. The top 10 here is just as good as most any other, that's for sure. Up next then, in our final Sega Arcade video, we're looking at the big 3D stuff, the late 90s and early 2000s games that would make up Sega's free model boards. The stage is set for another round of serious arcade classics. That's to come. For now, it's time to go and broom the hell out of more baddies. Bye for now! Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video, then hey, please do like it, and if you really like me, subscribe to my channel, have a look at my social media links, have a look at my Twitter, have a look at my Twitch, hit that bloody notification bell, and all that other good vlogger stuff. And if you really like what I do, perhaps you might want to have a look at my Patreon. You can find exclusive videos, you can find wrestling documentaries, and you could join this list of very awesome people right here. Alexa Jones-Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Arcade LY Webmaster, Asobi Quan DX, Brian Henniger, Chris Conrad Pritchard, D. Xulior, Rimwon Sutter, Dagoraf, Dungeon Keeper, Daniel Lomez, Danny Wolfers, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dinty76538, Dustin Cooper, Gary Samaden, Geordie Alex, Glunfeth, 
Jay is Manchild, James Brown, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lucas Kaligowski, Matthias Gramzov, Michael Halliday, Mike Clayton Travis, Martin Pataki, Nate Milbank, Neem Kieran, Peter Margell, Ren Bimon, Robert DeFelice, Rusty Kelly, Seth A. Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Tara Kamir, Tim Wald, Yerka Operator, and to all the rest of the glorious community. Thank you so much and goodbye.